is confusion. Okay. Um, well, hello everyone. Ah, uh, welcome. And I'm so very glad you have joined the Friends of San Pedro Valley Parks Lecture Series. I'm Mila Stroganoff, Programs Director and Field Trips Director for the Friends and your host tonight. It is it's spring and we are certainly looking forward to it, but the last of winter is still showing its strength. And here we are with some of the final storms of the season. I hope that you are joining us with a cup of Irish coffee, maybe brandy, hot chocolate or tea for a fascinating lecture. I'm very pleased to have Dr. Carlos Davidson with us tonight. He has kindly agreed to give us a presentation on amphibians in Pacifica and globally. And by the way, does anyone know which amphibians we have in San Pedro Valley Park? So stay tuned and let's find out. Moving on. During tonight's lecture, we will stop at the end of certain sections and of the lecture, at which time Carlos will take questions that have arisen. So please write your questions down and we will delve into an informal Q&A at several times over the next hour. And also a couple probably at the end, if they're there. Um, we have excellent news to impart. We will have the lecture. The, re the lecture is being recorded and will be posted to our website in a week or two. Our website is friends of San Pedro Valley Park org. Also, while I have your attention, consider becoming a member if you aren't a member and supporting the programming. Um, also, a heads up for all of you is that on Tuesday, August, uh, April 23rd, I'm pushing the time, it's not August, April, <laughs> April 1st. Okay, April 23rd at 7 p.m., we will have artist and educator Alyssa Callan with us for her program that is all about sustainable use of plants and fungi to make natural pigments, painting with natural inks or plant pigments as environmental stewardship. That's the long full title. This should prove to be a fascinating lecture for everyone, especially those interested in botany, plant pigments, and art in general. And now about our speaker this evening. Dr. Carlos Davidson is a herpetologist and professor emeritus of environmental studies at San Francisco State University. His conservation biology research focused on the causes of amphibian population declines both globally and in California. He is interested in issues of environmental justice, sustainability, and climate change. And I am absolutely delighted that he's with us. So Carlos, take it away. Okay, thank you so much, Mila. Um, it's great to be here. And thank you everyone who uh, turned out on this Saturday night um, to hear about amphibians. Um, Okay, let's see if this works. Okay, got this, uh, okay. Um, here's an outline of where we're going today. Um, I guess that's left over from academic talks outlines. <laughs> um, so, so, but you know where we're going. We're gonna talk about what is an amphibian. Uh, amphibians are cool, just some appreciation for, for how interesting they are. Uh, amphibians are in trouble, and then we're going to, and that's all kind of globally, um, and then we're going to talk about local amphibians, particularly San Pedro Valley Park, but also kind of the San Francisco Peninsula. And then I'll close with a little bit on resources on amphibians, if you want to learn more or identify something or what have you. Okay, and I'll be taking after each of these sections, or at least most of them, um, I'll be taking questions and just to make it a little more informal and also questions at the end. Okay, so what is an amphibian? Amphibians are three groups, frogs and toads, one, one group, salamanders and Sicilians. And you probably know what a frog or a toad is and you probably know what a salamander is. Sicilians, we'll see a picture in a little bit. They're pretty weird. Um, there are about 8,000 species uh, globally. Uh, and they're most abundant in the warm tropics. 
but the United States is actually the center of salamander diversity with over 200 species. Um, they have aquatic larvae that then go through metamorphosis to become some sort of adult form, often terrestrial, um, where the larvae are, are in the water. Amphibians have evolved from fish and were the first land vertebrates. And then amphibians are the ancestors of all the other land vertebrates. Reptiles, mammals, and birds all evolved from an amphibian ancestor. Here's an artist's rendering, probably based on some fossils, of an early fish it kind of on its way to become an amphibian. It has lungs and its front swimming flipter flippers have now evolved for walking around on land or dragging their body on land. And here's a picture of an early amphibian. These things were huge, um, about six feet long. Um, yeah. And for those of you who like phylogenetic trees, you can see on here that the, down at the bottom or, or on the far left are fish. Fish are the first vertebrates. And then next came amphibians. And then subsequently from the amphibians came mammals, lizards, and birds in some actually kind of complicated sort of ways, which we won't get into. But amphibians are the first land vertebrates, and then all the other vertebrates evolved from them. Maybe I'll wait to take questions. I'll do the amphibians are cool, and then I'll take questions. And diverse. So here's a mountain yellow-legged frog in California, Sierra Nevadas. And this is kind of what we often think of as a typical frog, kind of, you know, not so beautiful in some sort of ways, I'll admit. Um, but take a look at this, a red-eyed tree frog from Costa Rica, just incredible looking. And an ornate horned frog. And a glass frog, also from Central America, with a clear body, and you can see its innards through, through its skin. And here's a recently discovered species from Indonesia. Here's the world's, this is a recent paper, this is the world's smallest vertebrate, about a third of an inch total length of the body, uh, Batrachocephalus pollux from southern Brazil. And this was just published in the in the last month or so. Um, there was another species that just a tiny bit longer that had had the crown as the the smallest vertebrate. But also on the other side, Japanese and Chinese giant salamanders are about just an inch short of six feet long. So gigantic. Beautiful colors, strange. This is an axolotl salamander that is aquatic both as a larvae and as an adult, um, used extensively in all kinds of laboratory research. These are from Mexico. And here's a Sicilian. Sicilians look like earthworms, but they're not, they're vertebrates. They're just like snakes and legless lizards are vertebrates that have lost their limbs, evolved. To, the limbs went away as they mainly live underground and wiggle around to move rather than using limbs. And these are um, in, in the tropics. There are no Sicilians up here in California. Here's an extinct species, the golden toad of Costa Rica. And this is a male. And here's a female. So amphibians sometimes are, are very sexually dimorphic. Look, the males and females look quite different. 
Okay, I don't know if there are any questions. Oh, it looks like there's one in the Q&A. I think I can see Mila. Do you want to read uh, a question? Uh, yes. Uh, sorry. Okay, let's have a look. Um, Linda is saying, I have only found two green, perhaps tree frogs in my backyard, but I am growing. I'm hearing quite a few in the past week. I'm on Linda Bar near a culvert that drains into San Pedro Valley Creek. So um, are there very few? Are, I gather. No, your tree frogs are doing great here in Pacifica, and we'll talk about them in detail and actually listen to some recordings and, and kind of think about what are they saying when you hear those calls. Mm. So that will be later on in the talk. And Barbara is saying, what is the difference between frogs and toads? So I think she's in the same ballpark like I am. Okay. Yeah. The difference between a frog and a toad, um, they're both a they're, they're They are very similar, but the difference is that frogs are sleeker, um, can jump long distances, where toads more often waddle and hop. They are not they are not sleek. Mm. Um, also, frogs tend to be pretty smooth uh, on their body, and and toads are are often um, warty skin. And no, you don't get warts from picking them up. <laughs> but do they have poison in those warts? Um, Some do. Yes, they do, and it depends what species. Mm. Um, and um, do they all? No, I'm going to say they do not all have, cer certainly not so. anything very strong. Um, but there are species in the tropics that have poisons that are so strong that um, indigenous people use them to tip, put the poison on arrow tips oh. and and make, make the arrow lethal to all kinds of animals. Okay. Well, yes. That's yeah. And we do have a species here in California, um, our newts. If you have a cut and you pick up a newt and get, get some of their skin secretions into your cut, you will get numbed. Yikes. Yeah, they're, 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 and you don't want to, you know, you want to wash your hands after you handle them. They, they have some pretty strong toxics on their skin. Mm hmm. Okay. Cool. Why don't we take one more and then. Uh, there's two more. You think we can handle two? Sure. Let's take the two. Okay. So Bill is asking, why are oxytil so good for research? That's a good question. I don't really know, except for partly, I think they are easy to breed and maintain in the lab. Mm -hmm. But I don't know exactly what sort, and they're used for all kinds of medical research and then also like basic biology. Um, but I don't know why them rather than, you know, some other salamanders or something. Good question. So, and Bing is asking, what is adaptive about having transparent skin, which I was very interested in too. What is the use of having your gut showing? Yeah, no, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> why, why did they evolve that? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I think, I think we've handled those. Okay. So we're, we're quite clear to move on. Uh, okay, and great. And I'll disappear. Good, good questions. Thank you, people. Um, so amphibians are in trouble. You may have heard globally, amphibians are not doing very well. And we're gonna talk about that. Um, population declines have been reported around the world, including here in California. Globally, 41% of amphibian species are threatened with extinction. So just a huge percentage in really bad shape. Um, 222 species are confirmed extinct or now have no known remaining wild populations. Maybe there's some captive breeding populations in a zoo or in a lab, but they no longer are alive in the wild. 
Amphibians are in much worse shape than mammals, birds, reptiles, or fish. And, and you know, there are conservation concerns for all these groups. Amphibians are, are of, of all the vertebrates, amphibians are in the worst shape. And what was called the amphibian, what was called amphibian population declines, and that's probably the term I will still use in this talk, but now people are talking about the amphibian extinction crisis instead to, to highlight kind of how bad it is. I do wanna say though that conservation efforts work where, where people have um, done captive breeding or where they've done habitat restoration if, if habitat um, destruction is, is a cause of decline. Um, they've been quite successful. So um, I, I do want to put that hopeful note in here that that stuff can be done and, and that it works when it is done. Here's a, a little graphic on percentage of species threatened um, by group and over on the left or at least my left, maybe it's reversed for you, I'm not sure. Over on the left in the green, in the green are vertebrates and you can see 41% of amphibians are threatened. And then over in the orange are some other groups and you can see cycads, palms are actually even in worse shape than amphibians. Okay. And let's talk about why is this? Um, habitat destruction, kind of one of the leading causes. And, and that's true for species in general. That's true for mammals, it's true for birds, um, it's true for plants that, you know, around the world humans destroy natural habitats through logging, through urbanization, through road building, et cetera. And that is a big cause. But there is also a disease, a global disease, uh, a fungal disease. It's called the chytrid fungus. And it has spread around the globe. It's, it's not everywhere, but it's close to everywhere. And it causes mass mortality events. So this is a picture of what we think of what is in a lot of ways a pristine lake. I put quotes around pristine, but it's up in the Sierra Nevadas. It's there's no habitat destruction nearby. Um, and yet here's mass mortality of mountain yellow-legged frogs at the lake due to the arrival of this fungus. And then a third leading cause of, of declines is climate change. And I'm gonna share an unfinished piece of my research on climate and amphibian declines in California. And just to give you a taste of, um, you know, what, what is research like and, and how do people answer questions about causes of decline? Um, and, yeah, don't don't take any notes. Don't feel like you need to, you know, um, but it's just to give you a sense of it. Um, so I studied declines of two California species. Um, the California red-legged frog, Rana dreitonii, and the foothill yellow-legged frog, Rana boilii. A little bit about the methods. Um, distribution and presence absence data for California red-legged frogs comes from some earlier research that, that I, I did. Um, and then the distribution and presence absence data for foothill yellow-legged frogs came from a friend of mine's PhD dissertation, Amy Lind. And then climate data is from this thing called WorldClin. Um, which is a, a global climate database that has annual average temperature and precipitation from 1950 to 2000. So long-term 50 year average temperature and precipitation data on a grid 
across the whole globe of a half mile spatial resolution. So pretty, pretty fine scale. You know, it won't tell you the difference between temperatures. Well, actually it almost will. I was gonna say between Valimar and Lindemar, but actually it would. Um, it wouldn't tell you the difference maybe between the front of Valimar and the back of Valimar. It, you know, that could be in the same grid. Cell, And then Geographic Information System, GIS, was used to overlay the frog site data on the climate data and from that then determine site temperature and site precipitation. So here's a map for California red-legged frogs of, of 279 sites with the red sites being um, sites where the frog is now absent and the green sites being sites where the frog is still present. And here's the same uh, sort of map for the foothill yellow-legged frog, uh, which goes up into Oregon. Maybe I'll go back for one second. This is the full range of the red-legged frog minus a few sites down at the bottom where the frog is still present in the mountains of Baja, California. Um, but I did not have that data. So most of the range. Um, and then this is the full range of the foothill yellow-legged frog. It's a California and Oregon species. Okay, so what did I find out? This is a red-legged frog tadpole, by the way. Okay, you're gonna have to bear with some charts, sorry. <laughs> that was the whole point of this talk is to torture you with data. No, don't worry, there won't be that much of this. Um, so on this graph, temperature is along the bottom axis, along the x-axis and it's in Celsius, and then rainfall in millimeters is along the y-axis. And I'm not gonna talk about the rainfall results at all. I'm just gonna talk about temperature. So um, we can kind of ignore the y-axis. But each site has uh, a temperature and a rainfall associated with it. So each site for the red-legged frog, the 279 sites, you can put onto this chart as, you know, wherever you place it, that's an indication of the precipitation and the temperature. So when you put them all on the, on the map and you color code them uh, for absent and present sites, you get a mess that looks like this. <laughs> and at first glance, there's no meaning whatsoever. But if we look at the median site temperature. That's the temperature at which half the sites are warmer, half the sites are colder. And in this case, that turns out to be just about 15 degrees Celsius. So then we have the warm sites over on the right, the cold sites on the left, and we can ask the question, what percentage of warm sites still have frogs present? And how does that compare to the percentage of frogs present in the cold sites? So at the warm sites, just about a third, a little over a third of the sites still have frogs present. So two thirds of the warm sites, the frogs have disappeared. On the cold sites, it's just the opposite. Basically two thirds of the sites still have frogs present. So a dramatic difference in presence absence by warm or cold sites. And this is, it's, it's, Statistical test, which you don't need to know or worry about, but um, it's statistically significant. It's it's not just chance. Okay, and let's do the same thing for the foothill yellow-legged frog. Again, we draw a median site temperature line. Uh, it's a little colder for, for foothill yellow-legged frogs. Um, again, we've got the warm sites and the cold sites. Um, and we get about just the same results. Again, about a third of the warm sites have frogs present compared to the cold sites where 
just about two thirds of the sites still have frogs present. Again, stats. So what do we make of this? Declines of California red-legged frogs and foothill yellow-legged frogs have occurred more at warm sites than cold sites. Some caveats, um, this is suggestive that climate change may be playing a role in declines, but you need to do a lot more work. You need to do multivariate statistics where you control for the elevation of a site and habitat destruction at the site. Because, you know, maybe, maybe there's some pattern going on with elevation and that's what's driving the temperature, but it really has to do with elevation. Or maybe there's some pattern with habitat destruction that we've destroyed more habitat in warm sites and it looks like there's a temperature pattern but it's really being driven by habitat destruction. So you'd want to bring those variables into your analysis. And then ideally you'd like to use a change in temperature variable rather than a long-term average temperature variable. Okay, and with all that, I will take questions. I see there's a bunch of them. So before we get to local amphibians. Okay, so we will continue. I didn't delete the others. So Charles, let's see, he says, Charles is saying I'm over 80 years old and over 60 years ago, I hunted and ate frog legs. Frog legs were easy to prepare and delicious to eat. Hard question, have you had any fried legs? And can the bullfrog still be hunted? So he's talking from the point of view of the cuisine. Yeah, mm. I believe as a kid, I did eat some frog legs. Uh, on a trip to France. Um, and I don't remember what they tasted like. <laughs> I, was Although, thinking... I wasn't, I didn't want to eat them again somehow. But it's interesting, red-legged frogs, part of their decline was they were harvested in mass, um, tons and tons and tons of them um, during the gold rush and afterwards. Um, for the legs. So you could buy red-legged frog legs that have been, you know, frogs that have been harvested in the Central Valley. You could buy them in a market in San Francisco. And yes, you can hunt bullfrogs. Bullfrogs are non-native. They don't belong in California. They, they are damaging to other amphibians and, and other species. They eat all kinds of things. Um, and you can get I don't know if you need a permit to hunt them or not, um, but you can hunt them and, and people do. And also, um, I think if you go to Chinatown, I, I, I did years ago and there are bullfrogs, you know, for sale in the market to, to eat. Um, again, I don't know if those are raised or if those are wild caught, but um it's probably a good thing to hunt bullfrogs as long as you, <laughs> as long as you know that you're hunting bullfrogs and not red-legged frogs. Okay. So this, um, so with this chytrid fungus, this is the same fungus that attacks the bats. It, it it's not the same fungus, but you are right that there is a white nose disease fungus that is killing bats. So. It's very weird that we have two pandemics of fungal diseases at the same time. Um, and and they're both chytrid? No, the chytrid is is only the amphibians. The bat fungus is a different fungus. Huh. Yeah. Okay. And it it has raised some questions of like, are there underlying causes? that may be contributing to, to the spread of disease. Um, I did a lot of work for a long time looking at the possible role of pesticides, of uh, undermining frogs' immune systems potentially, and therefore making them more susceptible to, to fungus. Um, I ultimately concluded that I didn't think that was going on. Um, and you know, that that has 
the evidence for that hypothesis has has not come through. Um, and then there's also the possibility that climate change is weakening frogs' immune systems or changing changing the balance between um, disease and and their host and making it harder for the frogs to fight off the disease. That's a hypothesis. We don't know at this point whether that's true. Okay. And then there were, uh, with any, is there any programs or, or initiatives to try and reintroduce the red-legged frog? I know that as you go towards Mori Point, they have ponds now. Uh, the GD, uh, NA, GD, NA, GD, Gold. NRA. And it, uh, yeah, they have uh, re recreated the ponds and, and the vegetation, and they seem to have, uh, I think the population has increased there quite substantially. Yeah, yes. So um, and so that's a habitat destruction example where, you know, the motorcycle use out at Maury Point and some other things um, really tore up that habit. Well, and the mining before that, much more importantly, uh, really tore up the place. And the Park Service has done a really amazing job of restoration work. And they've created these ponds and the ponds are doing really well as habitat for red-legged frogs. Um, I don't, I mean, I think there probably are some red-legged frog habitat reintroduction programs, but those programs have focused on some, some other species that are doing even worse. So even though red-legged frogs have lost 70% of their range, um, they're doing fairly well in the remaining part of their range, but their captive breeding frog programs for mountain yellow-legged frogs um, and, and for other species, um, particularly in the tropics, um, that, that are, you know, much more on the, uh, on the edge. On the brink of extinction, yeah. Yeah. And Barbara is asking, how is the fungus transmitted, this chytrid fungus? Oh, really good question. Um, it moves around in water. So if it's if it's in a lake, then it goes downstream. Um, but it manages to move upstream. And um, that's not good. I think people still, you know, partly it moves with animals that move. So so frogs move over land. And when they move over land, they can, you know, take an infection with them. Um, there are some species that can get infected but don't get sick. So they then transmit the, the fungus to other species that, that do get sick. Mm. Um, and then there's a thought that and and you know, this is always uh, I laugh a little bit because you know s sometimes we suppose things and yet we don't really quite know and we don't have the research to to prove it. But but so people think that birds, you know, if a bird catches an amphibian or bird has some mud on its feet and then it flies over a ridge top and lands in a new lake, it can move the fungus. And um, the fungus sure manages to move, you know, uh, up over mountains and into new drainages. Um, but I don't think we know exactly how at this point. Mm -hmm. And we have suppositions, but not data that will prove one way or the other yet. That's what I think, although. Um, maybe there's some more recent research in the last, you know, year or two that that I've missed. But um, when I was last paying attention about three years ago, um, we still didn't know really well. And one more question, if I may, at this point. Sure. Bing Bing is saying, are there natural predators? Example, example for the garter snake. 
temporarily at reduced numbers, are they? So are there natural predators of... Let's say the garter snake. Which... Yeah, yeah. And so at Maury Point, we have this funny situation where the federally endangered garter snake eats the federally threatened red-legged frog. Oh. Um, so, <laughs> um, um, they're, they're keeping their own natural balance there, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. And so that's, a, that's okay. That's okay. Um, and I should mention, I didn't mention it in the, in the kind of lists of uh, causes of global decline, but introduced predators also plays a role. So in the Sierra Nevada, fish have been introduced in thousands of lakes that used to be fishless. And that has not been good for the mountain yellow-legged frog that now has to contend with predators in, in a lake where they didn't have predators. And yeah. same thing with bullfrogs. Bullfrogs are all over California. They're big, they eat native frogs. Um, that's contributed to their decline. And uh, Susan has come through with a question about the chytrid fungus. And it says, that does it have spores that could be carried by the wind or is it a, is it that type of a fungus or it, or would it allow it to spread with a biotic host? It's it's an aquatic fungus. It it as far as I know the and water water is generally just an you know a, a vent of yeah, I don't think it has airborne spores. I think it I think the spores are waterborne. Waterborne and water carried and then by other and by other animals. Yeah. Mm. Amphibians and maybe other species too that can carry the the fungus on their body and even get infected but not sick and then and the were... fungus reproduces on their body and sends spores out into the water that then can can kill um, native frogs. So there are carriers in all of these various fung you know fun fungi and dis fungal diseases and so on that will not affect certain species and affects others to the point where they will decimate that particular species. Yes, yes. And, and you know, even among amphibians, like I said, there's some that, like bullfrogs, seem to get infected and not much happens to them. And same with Pacific chorus frogs. They get infected and not much happens to them. Mm -hmm. um, where red-legged frogs or even more severe mountain yellow-legged frogs um, die off in, in these big mass extinction events. Hmm. And and one doesn't see one doesn't see any amphibians that have evolved to replace them yet, right? Because that takes place over millennia. Well, um, actually, some of the good news is that within and you know this is the same, you know, same with people. Some some people are more resistant than other people to a particular disease. Frogs have fairly short generation times. So what we're seeing is the, the selection for resistant individuals. And some populations, if they can make it through, you know, the disease uh, attack, and if enough individuals can survive, then the, the, sometimes the offspring are more resistant and populations can come back. And we're starting to see that in the Sierra Nevada, that mountain yellow-legged frogs are coming back from places where they nearly went extinct, but they didn't. You know, some small population remained, and that is now the source population for a growing and resistant population to the disease. So it really depends on kind of population to sizes and whether the population has, you know, the 
the, the genetics in them or maybe also the habitat variability because maybe it's in a cold site that they managed to survive. Um, and so do they have a bunch of cold sites and can that then be the source for the population coming back? So a lot of variability around the world of species that have gone extinct to species that don't seem susceptible at all to species that are susceptible, but are um, managing to now come back from the, the ravages of the pandemic. Right. Well, genetic variability, right? Yes. 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 Yeah. Good old Darwin, right? Okay. So okay. Let's talk about local amphibians. So we've talked about kind of amphibians in, in general. Let's talk about some of the local ones. Um, in San Pedro Valley Park, we have uh, six species, two, two frogs, and four salamanders. And of these, um, four of them, we have confirmed observations in the park. And for two others, I'm going to say, I think they're in the park. They're confirmed observations very nearby and there's the habitat that they use in the park, but we don't have a record and a date, and we can't say that a California red-legged frog has been sighted at such and such location at such and such date in the park. But they probably were there at some time or probably still are there somewhere. So we're gonna look at each of these species and we'll also look at some other ones that are nearby uh, on the San Francisco Peninsula. So this is the Pacific Chorus Frog, Sudacris regilla, um, also known as the Pacific Tree Frog or Sierran Tree Frog. So it's, it has a bunch of different names, which is a little confusing, but it's all, all the same thing. Um, this picture um, I took up in the Sierra Nevada, and so it's on, on a granite habitat. And you notice the color coloration um, blends in quite well. Um, here in San Mateo County, you'd probably see a Pacific tree frog that looks like this. Um, they do change color, but it's really different than a chameleon or an octopus, which can move into an area and pretty much instantly change color to camouflage themselves. Um, Pacific tree frogs, some individuals, not all of them, seem to have the ability to, or do have the ability to change their color over days or weeks. So that doesn't do an animal any good that jumps from a green place to a brown place to a white place. They can't change color as they move around. But if they're living in a habitat that is generally green, they can slowly turn green. And here's my favorite camouflage one. This is a picture in the immigrant wilderness. Um, and even when you see the frog, it's hard to keep seeing it because it fits so well with the, the background color. But again, this is, you know, this is not what a, you know, chameleons can do this and they, they can make blotches and stuff like that. The chorus frogs can't they can change their general coloration. They have blotches, so, you know, but, but they, can't, um, they can't match a background. So a little bit of information about them. We're gonna talk about two species in some detail and then just look at pictures of a bunch of others. Um, Pacific chorus frogs are the most commonly seen and heard species in Pacifica. They live around creeks and ponds. Um, they are hard to see, even though they are the most commonly seen, um, but they can be easily heard at night calling in the breeding season, which is November to July. And so they can be heard at the Maury Point Ponds or along Calera Creek or San Pedro Creek. Um, so if you just go out at night during that time, like, like now, um, the good chance you can hear a, a Pacific chorus frog. Um, even though th sometimes they're called tree frogs, they don't live in trees. 
Um, I said this before, so individuals can slowly change color. Um, they used to be one species statewide, um, then um, biologists split them up into three species and gave them three different names. And just recently in the last month or two, um, I'm happy to say they combined them back to one. <laughs> I never liked them having all different names. So um, we can call them Pacific chorus frogs or even you can call them tree frogs, that's fine. Okay, let's talk about recordings a little bit, sound. Because one of the cool things about frogs is, is they make calls. Um, I mean, lots of animals make calls, but frog calls are particularly nice. So I'm gonna play for you um, five different calls. And I wanna talk a little bit about um, these different calls. What What is their function? So advertisement calls used to be called mating calls or breeding calls. And um, they are made by males to attract females. So hence the, the mating call name. But then there was a realization that the function of the call was really different depending on who heard the call. And so when the female hears the call, yes, indeed, they hear a mating call. The male is saying, you know, hey, baby, hey, baby, over here, over here. Um, but when another male hears the call, they hear a territorial call, basically saying, I'm over here and stay out of my area. So that's why they're called advertisement calls now, rather than mating or, or breeding calls, because they serve these multiple functions depending on who hears them. Um, I'm going to talk about them all and then I'll play them all at once. Um, an enhanced mate attraction call is a call that a male makes when it senses that a female is close. It switches from its advertisement call to this faster attraction call. An encounter call is an aggressive call. Uh, typically when two males get close together, um, they'll start making these encounter calls saying, get out of my area. A release call is when two frogs are holding each other, typically in mating, and the frog being held wants no more of it. It issues a release call, basically saying, let go of me. Um, and then a dry land call is a call that males make um, away from breeding ponds and, um, and not during the breeding season. And we don't know what the function of that is. Um, but you can hear them. You can hear them in Pacifica. OK, so let's play these calls. Here's the advertisement call. And this is one individual, and then we'll hear a whole chorus. Pacific chorus frogs make a variety of other calls, including an enhanced mate attraction call, which is a one-part call repeated rapidly, Trilled and counter call, heard here with advertisement calls and people in the background. Oh. 
Release calls. And a one part dry land call given away from breeding ponds. Okay, and the second species we're going to talk about a little bit is California red-legged frog. This is a picture taken out at Maury Point. They are Mark Twain's jumping frog of Calaveras County, if you've ever read that. They're the largest native frog west of the Mississippi. They're almost four inches across the body. They're relatively long lived, eight to 10 years, maybe even longer. They have disappeared from about 70% of their range. They are federally listed as a threatened species under the Endangered Species Act. And they're doing well here in Pacifica. And like I said, they can be seen out at the Maury Point ponds. Um, they prefer cool, deep water, and they like willows and other dense vegetation for hiding. Here's a map um, of, of their range in California, with the red sites being places where they have disappeared, and the blue sites where they are still present. And you can see there are their present range is on the central coast and in the Bay Area. They've disappeared completely from the Central Valley, from most of the Sierra Nevada foothills, and from most of Southern California. And off the map, there's a couple present sites in the mountains of Baja. Here's a map of uh, observations in the Bay Area. And you can see they're just all over the place. Uh, a little note about the circles in the ocean. Um, this map is from iNaturalist, and since it is a federal threatened species, iNaturalist hides the exact location of the observation, and it does it by randomly moving the location um, in some direction, and hence all these dots end up out in the ocean. There are no red-legged frogs out in the ocean, um, but um, I show the map just so you can see that they are all over the place here. And let's listen to their call. Their call, um, I'll, I'll say Pacific, you can't tell on a recording. Um, everything sounds about the same volume on a recording. Pacific chorus frogs are really loud. You can hear them at, at 200 yards away. A, uh, a California red-legged frog, you have to be right there. They are very quiet. Um, so, you know, really even 50 feet away, you probably wouldn't hear it. Okay, and we're just going to go through and look at some pictures of the other four species that are um, that are in in the park. Uh, there's rough skin newt, and I'm going to skip these maps in the interest of time. There's California slender salamanders all over the place. 
They're in Satina. And again, all over the place. You can tell in Encetina, they're, they're between their body and their tail, it's very pinched and narrow. And they have this beautiful orange yellow color. And a boreal salamander with a big old head. And a couple pictures of some things nearby, but not in the park. So a Western toad, and they're south down the peninsula, but, but not north of Highway 92. Uh, uh, California giant salamander. Again, down the peninsula, but not in Pacifica. A California newt. And again, much farther down the peninsula. And California newts and rough skin newts at first glance look identical. And they are very similar looking species. Um, but there is a way you can tell them apart. And that's to take a look at the eye. The belly color on the California newt comes all the way up right to the edge of the eye where the belly color on the rough skin newt clearly stops well below the eye. So if you find one, that's, that's the thing to take a picture of and to look for to tell these two species apart. Um, okay, and I'm gonna wrap up with um, just a couple words on resources and then take any remaining questions. Um, there's a website called California Herps. It's really great. Um, you just Google California Herps and you'll get it. It's got pictures and range maps and recordings and all kinds of information. Uh, there's iNaturalist, which is a phone app for reporting nature observations. And it makes these maps like this. And this is for Encetina. We can zoom in here. And notice here's Pacifica, and here I've circled uh, an observation in San Pedro Valley Park. If we clicked on that, we'd get a little pop-up uh, menu here, and we can see a picture of the observation. We can see the date that it was observed, and we even get a little picture of the person who made the observation. And then if we want, we can open that up and get a whole page of information just about the observation, kind of when it was seen, who helped identify it, um, a whole bunch of stuff. Was it dead or alive or, you know, all kinds of things. And then if we want, we can get information about the species too. So iNaturalist is, is super helpful and, and useful. And then finally, if you're interested in frog call recordings, um, I have a CD of uh, Pacific Coast Frog and Toad Calls. Um, it was put out by the Cornell, Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology. It's now out of print, but I've put it up for free on my personal website. So you can go there and download all the recordings and also download a little booklet on frog calls and on the species on the Pacific Coast. So that's carlosdavidson.org and um, you can go get that for free. And there's a second one for the Rocky Mountains if you're headed to Colorado. Okay, let's take remaining questions. All right, so we're back and we tackled quite a few of these, all calls. Um, so uh, Susan is asking, are all calls answered? So we might be hearing males calling and females answering, or do we only hear the males call? Um, in, in most species, um, in terms of like advertisement calls, um, only males make a call and the females don't call back. The females do make release calls 
if they're in amplexus, they're mating with a male. And when they're done, they will make a call saying, okay, let go of me. Um, so they're not silent, but they don't make advertisement calls. Um, they don't make encounter calls. Um, they do make, um, there's also a call, like if a predator grabs a frog, a female will, will make an alarm call. Um, so again, they have the vocal cords, but they don't, don't make sounds as part of the mate attraction process. They pick and, and it, so they get to come into the chorus and listen to all the different males calling and go, mm, I think I like that one and head over there. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, they're not passive, but, um, you know, they, they are ultimately deciding who to mate with, um, but they don't call. And um, yeah. And Jack is wondering, is, is, this, is the Y-shaped mark on the Pacific chorus frog's head an identifier or just part of random blotches? Let's go back. Let's see. That doesn't make you... Yeah, so notice like on this one, a San Mateo County often one, that sort of Y-shaped blotch, you can see a little bit of it there, but it's pretty well hidden. The more identifying uh, thing is the black stripe through the eye. And look on all three of these different color morphs, they all have the same black stripe through the eye. That one that one and that one's kind of hard to see but it's it's you can see it on the upper surface a bit yeah could 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 the success of 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 a of a of a frog be based on whether or not through all the noise and pol noise pollution that we have that the females won't hear the males if they're if the call is low Definitely. So there's all kinds of, there's, there's a lot of information in a frog call. And one of the things that, that is being conveyed, even though maybe, you know, there's no intention to, but it is a piece of information, is the size of the frog. A bigger frog will have a deeper call. And also same with volume. The volume of the frog may indicate the fitness of the individual and a female may pick out louder, deeper calls to choose that individual to, to mate with. So yeah, definitely can be fitness aspects in terms of um, aspects of their call, volume and, and pitch. Mm -hmm. Right, it would seem to be. Because, you know, think about it, that there is a chorus with a whole bunch of males, you know, sometimes 50, 100 males all at a pond. And the females come in, they hear all this, you know, concaphony of different calls. They have to pick where do they go in the pond, which, which individual calling male uh, are they attracted to? That must be an interesting choice. <laughs> wow, not easy, not easily accomplished. Um, and what is, is there? In a, there is a state amphibian, isn't there? That's that is this question. I think we do have a state amphibian, and I don't know what it is. Oh, I'll have to look that up. Ooh. I was going to say it should be the California red legged frog, but I don't know if that's true. Mm. And uh, when you were mentioning the Sicilians and you said they look like worms and sort of they're legless and all the rest of it, what precisely is it that makes them different from worms? Worms are worms and they have this notochord and backbone too, don't they? That and and Sicilians No, no notochord. The worms are the worms aren't vertebrates in any sort of way where the Sicilians 
you know, are closely related to to a frog and they've they've got a backbone and, you know, have the a central nervous system like we do. Um, yeah. Oh, so there is that distinct difference between. Oh, I see. OK. Yeah. Yeah. A uh Sicilian -huh. is just like a salamander without any legs, but uh -huh. <laughs> it's otherwise inside, you know pretty much like a salamander. It's got a backbone and- It's just given up its legs for whatever reason. Yeah, and just think about think about a snake and a lizard. We, we kind of are okay with it. They're like, okay, a snake and a lizard are pretty similar to each other, have similar skin, have similar looking faces, et cetera, but one of them has legs and the other one doesn't. Mm-hmm, right. Okay, I believe. Oh, 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 oh! More questions popping in here. Oh, oh, oh! Gotta check them out. Uh, let's see. Uh, well, Susan says a very, very cool talk. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise and obvious love of amphibians. And an uh, anonymous and attendee, the official California state amphibian is the Reina Dreytonia, the California red-legged frog. Yay! Yes, indeed. Yes. Somebody's Thank been... you. <laughs> Somebody's been busy Googling, I'm glad. That's great. Or they knew it. <laughs> uh, it's been, oh, and someone's mentioned that the red-legged frog is uh, the state amphibian since 2014. So there's a bit of an additional. Great, great. Yeah. So everyone and... has come through with my, with the question, the answer to that particular question. Great. So that's wonderful. <laughs> so it's clearly identified so uh google laugh out loud yes 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 i know google but i've got my hands full thanks <laughs> <laughs> i can't do everything at the same time sorry folks um, <laughs> but um um so um so i think we you've you've very well have answered all the questions and and we've had a most remarkable Talk, talk on amphibians and, and you've opened up our eyes and ears. So Great. Thank you so, so much. And uh, I think we'll we'll end the, the webinar. And yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. And those who are, uh, pre, uh, are Carlos's friends, would you please stay on and um, um, and the others, if you will drop off, then I can uh, Carlos can speak and see his friends. So <laughs> <laughs> odd request, but do please drop away and we will we will have a, a short discussion here and meeting with just friends, if I can arrange it. So the webinar is indeed complete and it will be on our website. So thank you all. So let me see, how do we go about, mm -hmm. let me oh, stop the recording attendee, first. Attendees. Right, so stop, I need to stop record. If I do a stop record, just a second.